Joining me now for this bonus episode of Locked On Gators is John Garcia, Sports Illustrated's Director of Football Recruiting, Locked On's Recruiting Insider. And obviously, it's been an eventful 24 hours for Florida Gators fans. But before we even talk about that, I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates that you want to talk to faster and for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. And John, we, we, we've had a go of things in the past 24 hours. Cormani McLean, who was deciding between the Florida Gators, Alabama Crimson Tide and Miami Hurricanes committed to the Miami Hurricanes. Um, and, and it didn't go well for Florida. Hasn't gone well for me. Thanks, Dono. What happened? That, that's, that's, I need to ask that because I don't know. Right. Let's let's start with Cormani himself, right? Uh, our, our buddy Brian Smith was there, spoke to Cormani. So according to Cormani, he told one outlet a couple months ago, Miami moved to the front privately. Obviously, all this is privately. He told our people that this was really something that developed over the last few weeks. And he told another outlet it was earlier this week. So clearly there was a, a shift behind the scenes from – uh, presumably Florida to Miami and he sort of didn't look back in, in that regard uh and it was kind of the perfect storm based on this recruitment right super high profile all the public and tangible facts push thing towards push things towards Florida right last three visits no visits elsewhere all the Lakeland, Polk County, Ahmad Black, all that stuff rolled into it. Corey Raymond, so many feathers in the theoretical cap for Florida. And yet Cormani says nothing this whole time. And I think that is probably where the industry, myself included, made the biggest mistake. Because when you talk to Cormani, really at any point, never declared a leader, never declared it was even down to minimal schools. Remember, we were talking about Georgia. BYU. We were talking about other schools in this recruitment based off of Cormani's words specifically. But look, it's, it's an information business, right? If it doesn't come from one source, you go to the next, right? You go to the camp, you go to the family, you go to the high school, you go to the teammates, you go to the college sources. And all of that corroborated the very public facing Florida momentum for Cormani McLean. So what happened was a quiet kid did it his own way. Things were behind the scenes in private, and he made his pick. Um, as surprising as it was to all of us, I mean, look look at the people in the video. I, mom, family, friends, the, all of Lakeland High School, um, there was surprise to, to be had everywhere you looked on Thursday night, and that's really the beauty of college football recruiting, right? You don't know until you know. Um, it's the same reason why we got to play these games on Saturdays, right? You, you have to play – things out and that said there's probably something to play out about this recruitment beyond the verbal commitment uh, i don't expect florida to just not try anymore with cormani and hello nick saban alabama we were talking about that official visit that was canceled you think they're not gonna try to reschedule it you know i'd be surprised if if he was done with visits but at that same token you got to give credit to mario cristobal to marcus van dyke and miami obviously Steady was 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 the course here from a communication standpoint. Um, they always were able to sell that potential of immediate playing time and uh, hit it home on that official visit and never slowed down from a communicate from a communication standpoint since. So a tough one for Gators fans. Um, we thought Jaden Rashada was kind of the floor of this recruiting cycle from an optics perspective, but it is now Cormani McLean. Uh, so what, from what happened from Cormani, nothing happened. Miami moved to the front at some point recently and that was it. So he picked Miami, but from an optical optical angle here, a, a lot happened in Florida, you know, theoretically dropped the ball here. So curious to continue to see the reaction, curious to see what Cormani does here going forward. Do you shut things down? Do you take more visits? What about National Signing Day in December? I think all those things will be interesting stories to look at. But for now, take the L's where they are, Gator Nation, Brandon Olson, uh, the entire recruiting industry, myself included, all the air quotes, the memes. I've seen a screenshot of me like I don't even know what I was saying at, the, at one point. That has made it to my Twitter timeline. Look, part of the business, uh, take it on the chin. We own up to it. 
we thought Florida. It wasn't Florida uh, in terms of that verbal commitment. So, again, congratulations to Miami. They got a heck of a player. And this back and forth between Miami and Florida is it reignited all in all in one motion at the same time. I think that part is is probably still very good for uh, for our timelines and college football as a whole. Yeah, I think the weirdest thing about the Cormani McLean commitment is that uh, Florida fans everywhere are just fully on the we should have got Cormani McLean, which you should have. I I will say, yeah, you you should have. <laughs> but at the same time, it's the um, John Reese had to, had to throw a bag at him late. Whatever happened, whatever this, that, the third. It's never that simple. It's never that simple, and no. literally nobody had an idea about this that this was happening. Like no, no one had any idea. And we were just kind of going with he hadn't been to Miami since June. He canceled the Bama visit. He's been to Florida and Gainesville multiple times, and it was like publicly we're kind of just piecing this together and everybody took the the hints and just went gator lock. Um, and, and then people got their feelings. Some of that was coming from Florida themselves yeah. too. I, that, that does need to be said in this. Case. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Like they, they felt they had it in the bag and, every, and they felt that, that, but Hormani never really said it. Like, like when they announced the commitment would be October 27th at 6 p.m., the commitment ceremony, it was kind of just like he's deciding between Alabama, Florida, and Miami. And it, there was kind of no leader, really. And I think everybody just ran with it, myself included, a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it just didn't work out. But now Cormani, for the time being, committed to the Miami Hurricanes. Next priority corner has to be Desmond Ricks, right, for the 2023 class. A hundred percent, right? A reclassified 2024 prospect, IMG Academy. Look, if not for Cormani McLean, we'd be talking about Desmond Ricks as the best corner in the country in, in this class, even with that reclassification, right? Six foot one out of Virginia Beach, long, comfortable with his technique, a little bit more filled out than Cormani at, at this stage right now. Um, again, a balanced player, obviously used to high-end competition coming out of IMG. Uh, you know, covering Carnell Tate every day. I mean, there's a lot to to love uh, about Desmond Ricks. And you don't make this move and reclassify with seven weeks until signing day without knowing, hey, okay, there's there's a few schools that are going to be in this. And I think for Desmond, Florida and Miami are both in that conversation. I think Alabama, LSU um, are also in that conversation as well. We'll see if he cuts his list further publicly. I think the last time he announced one, it was at 10. No way it's at 10 privately at this point. So curious to see when he does start to shrink that list, the schools that pop up. But I'd be surprised if Florida, Miami, Alabama, LSU weren't um, in that grouping once those cuts uh, are to be made. Um, and then, of course, you can't you can't sleep on the Ohio States, the Georgias of the world on top of it. So I think the only school where we feel like maybe on the outside looking in is Florida State at this point because of that that whole – buzz and then they stop talking to me kind of deal i think that stings a little bit more now from the florida state perspective um although i did see a report that he might take a visit there this weekend so curious to see where desmond spends the next few weekends on the recruiting front because it is going to be under much more of a microscope and yeah that's going to be the big one here going forward i mean florida's got a great db class i think we've talked about it at length here um Big, long, physical defensive backs on board, uh, especially at corner, right? With uh, Dijon, Jakeem Jack Jackson. Uh, you've got Sharif Denson, who I think is still maybe the most underrated defensive recruit that Florida has on board publicly. Still a great secondary class, a couple safeties mixed in on top of it. But obviously there was room for at least one more corner. That is a fact. So if not McLean, why not Ricks? I think it would be equally as impressive of a victory on the recruiting trail, but optically maybe not the same type of impact, but at the end of the day, that's not what matters. What matters is the facts and what matters is who, who you're bringing in and how it looks after that point, not necessarily how it feels when it goes down. Yeah. Uh, I think that that's one of the things where, you know, Desmond Rakes, Cormani McLean, I don't care either way. I'm not the type to get like super upset about a recruit. You still got like 70 beasts committed for this, for this year. Sure. Most of them four stars. I, I think it's safe to say like, I feel comfortable with the DB class. It could always get better, but I, I think I feel comfortable at least personally with the Florida Gators class. I know Gators fans 
kind of had Cormani pencil in there. So him not being there for the time being uh, definitely hurts for them. But moving on from that now, no no more DB talk today. I'm, I'm sick of it. I, I don't want to talk DBs. I'm upset now. This episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, which is the easiest place to spice up college football season. And I, I will say this. I am a big fan of no risk it, no biscuit. I'm risking it for Florida, Georgia. I'm taking Anthony Richardson to have higher than 38 and a half rushing yards. I'm taking Stetson Bennett to have higher than 10 and a half rushing yards. And I'm taking Justin Shorter to have higher than 34 and a half receiving yards. You could tail if you want or, or fade if you want, but them all under. Why not? Sign up with the promo code locked on underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. You deposit $100 and you get another $100 free. But looking at the the trenches for the rest of the day, right now, defensively, there's Caden McDonald is the big name that the Florida Gators fans should be focused on commits this Monday. Um, I, I know that it, it's kind of, there's Ohio State, there's Clemson, there's Oklahoma, there's Michigan. I'm sure there's other schools there. The Florida Gators are in there somewhere. Oh, um, you gave the Gators the quote. Yeah, so that means we're getting it, right? Yeah, yeah why not? <laughs> And if he commits to Florida, I hope Gators fans keep that same energy and throw the air quotes up there. But how should Florida Gators fans feel about Caden McDonald? Well, look, we talked about how loaded this DB group is for Florida. The D-line is right there. I mean, these are the two most stacked volume-specific position groups on board uh, for Billy Napier and company right now. So in that regard, this is icing on the cake. This is a luxury at this point for Florida to be in the conversation. Like you said, McDonald's tough to peg um, ton, a ton of official visits. I think all, but the Florida ones have been during the season. So he's gotten in four game day atmospheres uh, at some big time schools, as you mentioned, Ohio state, Clemson, Michigan, Oklahoma, as well. That Florida official was, I believe in June to kick off the official visit slate uh, f- for the Atlanta area standout. So, yeah, how much staying power do you have after that first visit versus all the other ones that have come and gone? What what's interesting about this one, which was which was not true for the McLean recruitment, there is confidence from more than one coaching staff. Miami was very quiet leading into McLean's decision, probably a smart decision there. Florida, not so much. And that was kind of it. Alabama was just like, we'll see on signing day. We'll see if we get that final visit. With McDonald. We hear confidence from Clemson. We hear confidence from Oklahoma. Maybe the most confidence from Ohio State, which has a huge need and a lack of depth on that defensive line in this class. Um, So we we start to hear it from multiple camps. And the Florida camp at last check, however trustworthy that is at this point, still kind of confident. So I think Michigan's the only school that we haven't heard a strong you know, stands for, um, but I, I think it's that wide open going into to Monday. We're just a couple days away at this point. Um, could it be one of those where McDonald doesn't even know necessarily, or could he be telling all these coaching staffs kind of what they want to hear before he makes that final call? Both are plausible. Uh, it's it's high level recruiting. It, it's something that uh, happens every cycle. So I think from a Florida standpoint, you feel like this is a luxury. You certainly don't put all your eggs in the McDonald basket. You're still covering other defensive linemen. Obviously, we saw James Smith, uh, the other kid up in Jacksonville who's taking his time. So there's there's other names out there, but certainly you'd like to win this recruitment, especially optically, over an Ohio State, over a Clemson program that are clearly at another level at this point. So you got a puncher's chance. It would be a luxurious get in this class because you've got a great D-line haul both inside and out already on board. Uh, so look at it that way. I think that's the best way to put it. it. It does feel that wide open, though, and that's rare this time of year. Usually you feel like it's down to two, maybe three teams. This one feels bigger with McDonald. Yeah, and, I mean, you, you just mentioned Florida has a big D-line class already, inside, outside players, ton of positional versatility here. Yep. But the defensive line right now on the field for the Florida Gators – not great. Um, yeah. You got Javon Dexter, who's having an underwhelming year, I'll say, uh, just given the expectations surrounding what he was supposed to do this year. You've got Desmond Watson exceeding expectations right now, which is because sure. a lot of people were like, hey, he's not even going to play much this year. 
And both of them are playing significantly more snaps than the average player at their position. I think Javon Dexter, I had Bud Davis here on Tuesday, and I think he was saying that Javon Dexter is on is on track to play the most snaps from any SEC defensive tackle ever. Uh, that wow. he's just playing so much. You need early bodies. And one of the issues has been the run game. And when you look at this defensive line class, you could always add more because defensive line is kind of a weird one where you have guys who are more gap shooters, guys who are going to be run stuffers from the edge and light inside. What kind of player is Caden McDonald? Because again, it's wide open. Florida, like I said, has a puncher's chance. So what kind of player is he and where does he kind of fit into this defensive line class? Yeah, this is more of a no-nonsense, I would say almost classic interior defensive lineman. This is one who is going to win head-to-head at the point of contact, uh, disengage, and and make a play off of it. Uh, This is not uh, a niche player who, like you said, he's, he's a gap shooter. He's a long and lean speed guy who has to win with his first step. It's not that um, narrow in terms of that skill set. And again, playing against great competition up in the Atlanta area, we see it every Friday night with McDonald. He is an absolute force, leverage, disengage, extend, or extend, disengage, make a play type of defensive tackle. So that can push you towards uh, great run defense and great um, pass rushing on top of it, especially compared to something that will be complementary on the outside of him. So I think he's more of an interior guy, um, balanced, kind of a no-nonsense approach, nothing flashy, nothing that is going to stand alone compared to some of the others that we've talked about already on the commitment list or certainly the target list. But I think a balanced kind of classic interior prospect who can get after it at, at zero, one, three, maybe even five, depending on uh, what the look uh, Billy Napier and, and those guys want to present. Yeah, and I love that because my listeners know I've been calling this defensive line for Florida – soft all year and and so i would love adding someone who who wants to be there is you know just take his lunchbox and throw it at you like i I just want him to be physical and on the other side of the trenches you got the offensive line florida i mean you had uh nigey harris you had bryce lovett and then you just add roger kearney the flip from florida state What is Florida getting in Roger Kearney? And how did this kind of shake out where he flipped from Florida State to Florida? If not for McLean, this would be the most unique recruitment to talk about, right? This this cycle. Uh, Everyone remembers when he committed to FSU, right? Freshly, I'm talking freshly off the visit to Florida. His water bottle probably hadn't even shown any condensation after the trip. (laughs) And he's in the parking lot and and calls up Mike Norvell to make the verbal commitment. So kind of almost a slap in the face type of recruiting win for Florida State against a rival Florida. And yeah, it could have went one of two ways after that, right? Florida could have said, well, if that's how you're going to treat us, good luck. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll see you on the field. Or you say, this is a teenager who made a decision. Let's continue to recruit our board at a major position of need and go from there. So that's what they did, obviously. Stayed with it, uh, and and Kearney ends up uh, flipping to Florida. I mean, just uh, an ideal situation for the Gators based on need, and and I love this get. Not only is he an in-state lineman, an elite lineman, SI-99 recruit, he is versatile. That that is what you need on the offensive line these days. You need guys who are swing players. Uh, Can they play multiple positions? Do you have the footwork and athleticism to play tackle? And do you have the physicality and leverage to play on the inside? Can you potentially move from one to the other as you develop uh, in your collegiate career? All of those boxes are checked with with Rod. And I think that's why he's maybe one of the most important offensive gets overall for Florida in this class, uh, because that's another position that's going to be overhauled with with this new coaching staff. So if there's an instant impact O-lineman right now, between the three, it is easily Kearney over the other two. No disrespect uh, to, to the other instators, but he is as as important to get at that position as Florida has on board in this class of, of 2023. I know there's some other targets out there. Uh, they need more volume. I think that's very clear uh, with, with the offensive line um, recruiting, you know, grouping so far. But that's a heck of a player to not only – win the recruitment of but to flip uh from a rival not the rival we keep talking about but from the other one in state that you actually play every year yeah um that i mean 
arguably could be more important that you actually win the one against the team that you're going to see yearly. Of course, we can talk about all these 2023 kids play Miami in 2024. So you will see a good deal of them. But I mean, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, Roger Kearney's little commitment graphic had the IHOP sign in the back and he was sitting on pancakes. And there's an uncommitted offensive lineman out there who is the pancake honcho, uh, which is, by the way, the sickest nickname (laughs) you can have for an offensive lineman. Samson Okunlola. I I will say everything I've seen, I'm not confident in it. But I think you have to talk about the possibility of Florida potentially getting Samson Okunlola to commit whenever he does commit. Well, that's the thing. The timeline here has been all over the place. Um, and look, I should, I'm just going to get it out the way. Miami's absolutely in the thick of that one. Just just before we move on to any other teams, Miami is absolutely in the thick of that Oak and Lola race, considered the favorite really by the industry, although doesn't always give you uh, an indicator on where a kid may be leaning. That said, wide open, it, it feels like, for Oak and Lola. Only taking three official visits. Florida did not get one of those. He talked about taking them in September if – he were able to take the other two. September came and went. He didn't take any. So now it's, can you take these visits before all is said and done? Now his high school season is winding down. So he might be able to take the visits on the back end of the recruiting process. Uh, so we know he can't take them to the schools he's already been to, right? Alabama, Miami, Michigan State. So that leaves the door open for two schools to potentially get him on campus before signing day. Ohio State is very much in the thick of that. Georgia, Florida, I would say Oregon feels good about their chances of potentially getting him on campus. That's kind of the grouping there. Can can you win first a visit and then talk about potentially winning the recruitment? And, of course, we're talking about official visits, right? Unofficial visits, quick trips uh, for games and all of that. Um, he, he's taken a few of those this season, uh, but they don't hit the same, right? You know, it's, it's not 48 hours on campus on that school's dime legally right it's not quite that same race Uh, so I I do think there's more visits ahead for Oak and Lola before uh, that final decision does come down because otherwise I think he'd have been off the board already very much not uh, a big uh, social prospect in terms of talking about his own recruitment certainly about his branding which I I fully support yes he's been on that train but not the recruiting train as much Um, at the end of the summer he had already taken those other three official visits so there was a thought that if he was ready and he said he was close that it was probably going to be Miami, Alabama right there uh, thereafter, at least from from a perception standpoint. But since that point, uh, other schools have certainly, you know, won and lost battles for other top offensive linemen. So naturally, a lot of them have circled back to Oak and Lola. And I believe Florida is right in the thick of that among those schools. So for me, again, tracking the visits, win an official visit, and you got a shot to, to win the recruitment in the end. So of these four or five schools that haven't had them on campus officially, two of them are going to receive a big boost right before national signing day. And and right now I would think Ohio state's in the best position to get a visit. Florida's in that group right after to me uh, where I could see him absolutely taking a a trip down to Gainesville before all is is said and done. So that's the next order of business with Oak and Lola. He looks like he could be the last big fish on the offensive line to to go public with that college decision. And that's probably good news for Florida, right? If, If you're playing catch up, You want the race to extend, in theory, about as long as it could be. Yeah, and uh, I think it's kind of important to at least touch on that these official visits, home games, Florida's got one left. Florida has one home game left on the schedule. Do it after the season. All in on recruiting. Don't worry about the game atmosphere. Go all in after the season right before pen meets paper. That, That would be my play if I had a choice. And there, there's two more O linemen to talk about. We can kind of group them together here because they fit in that same category with Roger Kearney as, as flip candidates because, you know, flip season is here. Yes. Francis Maui Goa from Miami, who was a really fun one, I believe. If, if I'm not mistaken, um, we knew pr- a little bit prior to his commitment that he wasn't going to Florida. Like that was a yes. thing where it was a few days before I think it was where it's like, hey, Florida, not you. Uh, Lucas Simmons with Florida State is someone who – I don't know anything about that one, but I know that late in the cycle, uh, I did not think he was coming to Florida as much as I hoped he was. But how are we looking with them in terms of flip candidates? I know a lot of people were like, oh, well, Miami's losing, Florida State's losing, so they're going to lose commits. Hasn't really happened much. Wins and losses are not appearing to 
hold the same weight that people thought they would which publicly. Which is good for Florida fans too, right? Fantastic for us, which yeah. I will also say the Hermione <laughs> McLean thing, um, just to circle back to that real quick, is that people were like, well, you like you can look at this Florida team and recruits can say, I could play early on this team. I could play early on this defense because they're bad. Miami gave up 45 to Middle Tennessee State on a lot of big plays, and then yeah. Miami gave up 45 to Duke. So the same argument works there. And the argument's probably better for Miami because you can go, well, I could play early and there's not six other freshman corners for me to compete with for playing True. time there. Um, but but to these O-line, Francis Mago and Lucas Simmons, how are we feeling about potential flip candidates? Is a door even open, do you know, or have they completely shut it down? They haven't shut it down in terms of communication. Maui Goa told me to my face, everyone's still calling. Uh, we assume Florida's in that group. Lucas Simmons, from the moment he committed to Florida State, other schools have continued to stay in the race because that one, different schools had buzz at different points for Lucas Simmons. Uh, so I think Florida was a little bit later among those who rose for Simmons. Florida State, I would say Tennessee and USC had the most buzz earlier in that recruitment. And then Florida tried to take some away later in the process before he came off the board. So uh, stretching that recruitment is good news for UF. Uh, same deal for Maui Goa. Um, he's been less clear on who, but look, this is maybe the best lineman in the country for us. He's the number one interior projection on SI. We, we know everyone's still calling for him, and it's the same schools, right? It's USC, it's Tennessee, and it's, it's Florida among them. So very interesting to see these two Floridians, at least by where they're playing now, even though they're both from other countries, <laughs> it, it will be interesting to see how it plays out here down the final stretch. Um, do, do they take late trips uh, up up to Gainesville? Um, they're both in the that Tampa I-75 corridor, right? IMG for Francis and Clearwater Academy for Lucas. Do you take a quick trip up to Gainesville before National Signing Day? If I had to guess now, I'd say both stick with their schools. Um, but look, there, there's these are offensive linemen. This is not something that gets talked about enough. They don't talk about it as much either. Before Kearney flipped, there were little indicators, nothing huge about, oh, my gosh, this is going to happen right now for UF. So keep that in mind when you look at these other recruitments. If you're going to flip them, especially, it's never going to be Cormani level hysteria in terms of every little buildup feeling like a big momentous moment in that regard. So if it does happen, it'll be quiet. It'll be behind the scenes. It'll be public probably on national signing day. But I think geographically and certainly from a positional need standpoint, those two know there's still a priority at Florida. Those two know they have a spot there. Should they reconsider uh, their current uh, options uh, elsewhere in the state? So those will be fascinating to keep an eye on. I would suspect both stick again, uh, but stranger things have happened in recruiting, right? Um, neither program, uh, neither of the three programs in state is playing very good football at this moment. And schools outside of the state are going to remind these kids of that all the way through the end of the cycle. So it'll be fascinating, uh, even with the big bodies on how flip season truly shakes out. But there's no doubt that Florida is still in communication with both guys. All right. Thank you so much, John. This was John Garcia, Sports Illustrated's Director of Football Recruiting and Locked On's Recruiting Insider. And we'll have you back, obviously, next week and the week after that. And hopefully my air quotes will not get us cooked anymore <laughs> on the timeline. But <laughs> Who knows at this point? Love it. Love it. Hey, if McDonald picks UF, then the air quotes flip back to the positive side. So we'll yeah, see. I'm, I'm hoping the bad juju will flip on Halloween. Like, I'm like, maybe it'll happen. Hopefully. <laughs>